You want to know what Jesus is most centrally about? It's about the coming of the kingdom of power. A Lutheran scholar named John Royman made the same point about 40 years ago in his book on Jesus and the Gospels. He wrote, ask any 100 New Testament scholars around the world, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, or non-believer, what was most central to the message of Jesus? And all 100 of these experts would say, the kingdom of God. So what's the kingdom of God? I've already said it's not about heaven. It's for the earth. It's about a transformed earth, not a transformation of the world of nature, but a transformation of the humanly created world of societies and domination systems. Um, and uh, this shouldn't come as a surprise to any Christian even though I think half of American Christians don't get it, maybe more than half, okay? It's right there in the Lord's Prayer. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray, your kingdom come on earth, as it already is in heaven. My friend and colleague John Dominic Crossan has the great one-liner about this. Heaven's in great shape. Earth is where the problems are. <laughs> and very importantly, kingdom in the first century was a political term. Jesus' hearers knew about the kingdom of Herod, and they knew about the kingdom of Rome, and in the Eastern Empire, where the Jewish homeland was, Rome referred to herself as a kingdom, not as a and so when they heard Jesus speaking about the kingdom of God, it would have meant must be something different from the kingdom of Herod or the kingdom of Rome. And if Jesus had wanted to avoid the political connotations of kingdom language, <clears throat> he could have spoken about the family of God or the people of God uh, or the community of God but he spoke about the kingdom of God. And what the kingdom of God is, is what life would be like on earth if God were king and the domination systems of this world were not. <clears throat> now, don't confuse this with theocracy. Theocracy is a bunch of guys ruling in the name of God. Okay? This is what life would be like on earth under the lordship of God rather than under the lordship of systems of domination. <laughs> then there is that famous passage that we know as the render unto Caesar passage that has often become the source of Christians making a separation between church and state. In the United States, that's the form it takes. Or for many other Christians, a separation between religion and politics. Okay. And again, <clears throat> the authorities are trying to trap him. Mark even tells us that uh, as he opens that particular story. Uh, now the Pharisees and Herodians came to Jesus seeking to entrap him in his speech. And they say to him, good teacher. Okay, a bit of flattery there, okay? Tell us, is it lawful, that is according to Jewish law, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, it's a real trap question because if Jesus says, yes, it's okay to do that, he will discredit himself with many in the crowd who deeply resented Roman imperial rule. But if he says, no, that's an act of high treason. And it would justify his arrest immediately. Rather than answering the question, Jesus says, do you have a coin? And one of them pulls out a silver denarius, which was the smallest silver coin at the time, in terms of value, roughly uh, 
a day's labor. Okay? <clears throat> and the silver denarius had the head of Caesar on one side uh, and, uh, and an inscription. Okay? And so they pull out a coin and hand it to him and he looks down at it and he says, whose image is this? And whose inscription is this? And of course, one of them says, Caesar's. Now, that's a critical point in the story, even though it's not over with yet. That immediately discredits the question askers with the crowd for two reasons. One, they are carrying a graven image, which they're not supposed to do anywhere, but especially in the temple court. And secondly, it also indicates they've answered the question for themselves. <coughs> and, <clears throat> and then let me add, the inscription on the coin would have had the titles of Caesar on it. These include Son of God, Lord, and we don't know if there would have been more than that on the coin. Oh, Augustus, of course, the one to be worshipped is what the word Augustus means. So they're carrying a coin with a graven image, but also with this idolatrous language about Caesar. But back to substitutionary sacrifice. There is no precedent, no foundation for this understanding of sacrifice as payment in the Bible. It's never about payment for sin, and it's never about the animal being a substitute for the human who is offering the sacrifice. It's never that the human being really deserves to be punished but God's willing to take it out on the boat. <laughs> okay. Most generally, in ancient Judaism, meaning the Old Testament itself, plus, of course, temple sacrifice in Jerusalem, most generally, animal sacrifice was about offering a gift to God. The animal was offered up to God as a gift. And because the animal is burned. Some of it goes up to God as smoke, but basically the animal ends up being cooked. And then it comes back to the people offering the sacrifice as a meal. And the meal is understood to be a meal with God. Because God has received part of the animal and the community eats the rest of the animal. So it's about communion with God. But again, the basic meaning is you make something sacred by offering it up to God. A social democracy is democratic, of course, and it values community, the whole of community. This is what Jot sees emerging in England after World War II. It's what you have had in Canada for quite a while, I think, and maybe in danger, I'm not sure. Uh, it's what many of the countries of Europe developed after World War II. Social democracy, at least in the States, is so much better a phrase than socialism or something like that. Socialism is like using the F word in public. Okay, okay, okay. It's like, oh. <laughs> um, So, the social democracy, of course it's democratic, but it values the whole of community, and of course that translates into things like a good safety net and universal access to health care and good public education and all of that. Okay? It's contrast is an individualistic democracy that is concerned primarily with advancing individual interests. And it's too bad that in the States, freedom has become associated with a radically individualistic democracy. You know, if you see the Republican candidates in news clips or whatever, 
almost always what's on the wall behind them is freedom. <sighs> it's the freedom for the most successful to keep as much of what they have earned as possible. Profoundly anti-Christian. Okay. Uh, very quick blessing, and then I'm done. I want to send you off with the greatest compliment ever paid to anybody by the highest authority. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And you won't recognize those as words spoken by Jesus to his followers. And we all know they were not perfected people. And yet he says to them, not about himself, but he says to them, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And so the commendation is, go and be light. Go and be salt. Participate in God's passion for transformation. Amen. Thank you.